Across the world, at the easternmost end of Indonesia, lies the land of Papua, vast and little known. Papua, a land of extremes, from snow-capped peaks to dense steaming jungle. It is home to a people called the Komoro. Even today, the Komoro still practice many ancestral traditions, hunting, fishing, and gathering for their daily needs. Rivers connect the Komoro to their food sources and neighbors. Without the canoe, life for them would be unimaginable. Today, Kel Muller, a consultant with a mining company, is going with Pakalo into the jungle. Kel has been studying the Comoros' relationship with their natural resources. The group is on its way to get a tree for the making of a traditional Comoro dugout canoe, or ku. For Cal, this is a great opportunity to observe and record a practice that has remained virtually unchanged. For Pakalo and his team, it will mean a new canoe. In days of old, when tribal warfare was still practiced, fleets of canoes carried the warriors on raids. But today, the canoes bring the Papuans from near and far to the Komoro Kakuru, an annual cultural festival. Though skilled paddlers, some prefer to arrive in a cloud of exhaust fumes, powered by the ever-popular Johnson, a commonly used name for any brand of outboard engine. Today's friendly warriors are met by the host village with nothing less than a hero's welcome. Typically, a dugout canoe lasts about a year. But for one that lasts two years, a tree called the tara is needed. But that is difficult to find. This is the cuckoo tree in Comoro, or Capenosperma brevipetiolata. The Comoro use other species of trees, but have chosen this one because it is one of the easiest to work with. The first task is to clear the area around the tree so that nothing will break its fall. The men have decided that a platform is necessary. Before the final felling, a log is wedged into the cut. It takes 10 men working eight hours a day, two days before the canoe is light enough to be brought to the river. The process is long and tedious, requiring backbreaking work in the hot sun. First, the top of the log has to be leveled. Then, slowly, the bulk of it hollowed out to form a trough. Using brute strength, the still heavy log has to be rolled onto its side. Then it's more chopping and stripping to roughly shape the canoe. Park Sabinus is Pakalo's brother and has come from Wari village. He will take charge of the carving of the canoe. Tradition dictates that only carvers who are Maro Moe are allowed to carve the canoe. Maro Moe is a hereditary title equivalent to master carver. Under his direction, more experienced members of the team like Alo, Sil and Leo work on the trickier parts like the prow and stern of the canoe. 
Erwin may be the youngest member of the team. But as Sabinos' son is getting an early start in his informal education as the next generation of Maromowe. While the carving of a canoe is solely done by a Maromowe, every Kamoro male must acquire the skills to make the body of a canoe. <laughs> The Komoro have kept many of the old ways in relying on the jungle for their various needs. A vine twisted the right way becomes a strong rope, and a small tree an instant lever. The only exception is the axe, which replaced the stone versions of their forefathers. In the 17th or 18th century, traders from Sarum introduced the first metal axes. Then, from the early 20th century, these became more available with Dutch and Chinese contacts. Depending on where the Comoros live, canoes are made differently. River canoes tend to be narrow and shallow, making them faster at maneuvering on rivers and in estuaries. Seagoing canoes tend to be wider and deeper, more suitable for open waters and high seas. In general, they tend to be about 8 to 12 meters, sitting five or six people comfortably. But there are times when the canoes carry a surprising load. At the Komoro Kakuru, it's not unusual to see a canoe arrive completely laden with people, including babies, cooking utensils, sleeping mats, costumes, chickens or dogs, drums, carvings, food, weavings, paddles, fuel and umbrellas. Somehow, everything fits in. <laughs> The time has come for the canoe to be brought to water. Small trees have been laid all the way to the bank to ease the process. Success. The half-completed canoe floats well, and the men will now be able to return to the village with their heads held high. For Robert and Yosef, their joy and pride is even greater, for the elders have given them the task of bringing the new canoes home. Komoro children learn at a very early age to paddle and handle a canoe. So bath time is always a great excuse for them to take the family canoe for a spin. So confident are Komoro adults of their children's abilities that Erwin is given a heavy responsibility, steering the canoe. It's up to him to keep it from being pushed sideways into the bank by the fast current while the adults haul up the canoe. Not always do plans go smoothly, but the canoe is not lost. This time, victory is on their side, much to Erwin's relief. The Komoro have found ways to mix tradition and modern technology. This man is putting on a motorized propeller called the Katingting. Mounted sideways, it is easily installed and operated. With their trusty hunting dogs, the men are ready for a day of wild pig hunting.
Aside from wild pig, the Camorra also hunt for crocodile, couscous, and cassowary in the jungles near the river. The women use the canoe to get to their sago fields to pound sago, collect sago grubs, mollusks, and trap fish in smaller creeks. Along the coast, families gather mangrove delicacies like crabs, prawns, shellfish, and the ever-popular tambelo, a kind of mollusk that is eaten raw. But often, the men will go out to sea to fish. The odd shark or stingray sometimes ending up in their catch. For the next two days, the men will continue to hollow out the canoe and refine the shape as they go along. Their goal, a canoe that is light yet strong. Leaving the heavy work to his sons, Pakalo concentrates on making lime. Bivalve mollusks called omopoko in Komoro are burned till the shells turn black. After a period of cooling, the crumbly shells are crushed and pounded into a white powder. Mixed with water, the lime solution is then applied all over the canoe. Not for artistic, but practical reasons. Tambelo is a kind of mollusk that feeds on wood. While not welcome in a canoe howl, tambelo is a much sought-after food. Finally, the canoe receives its own identity. An intricate pattern is etched out along the sides. Komoro motifs have an abstract beauty, but are highly symbolic, reflecting elements of nature. Park Victor, also a master carver, has been asked to lend a hand with the carving on the stern. It is customary for the carvings on the stern and prow to be of human figures. But the way they are portrayed is the choice of the carver. And as for who is to be honoured, that decision lies with the owner of the canoe. Supaya kasih nama perahu itu dari bapa mama dan depan ini itu mukanya bapa itu sudah ini tunjukkan oh perahu ini nama bapa itu yang anak-anak cucu kasih nama perahu ini nama tet nenek ini tete ini. With their likenesses adorning both ends of the canoe, the Camorra believe that their ancestors' spirits are near. Artinya ada kecelakaan, kalau itu bisa ada ada pertolongan, ada pertolongan buat. And that for the Camorra is a major concern, since the canoe is the chief means of travel, whether it's to obtain food, building materials for their homes, visiting relatives or going to town. Since the inception of the annual Kamoro Kakuru, the canoe has a new purpose that's been keenly adopted, canoe racing. Participating villagers feel the best men and women paddlers, all hoping to win top honor. Competition is hot and the crowd goes wild. Meki, Pakala's son, has been busy locating a supply of old atab for the firing of the canoe. A layer of mud will protect the carvings from being destroyed in the heat of the flames. Itu untuk keseringan perahu dan dan perahu yang bengkok sedikit. Leo carefully watches the last and vital step in the making of his stepfather's new canoe. Pakalo has left it to him, knowing that Leo, though only 25, is fully capable of the task. After all, it was Pakalo who taught him everything. Dilihat dari orang tua, akhirnya mereka kerja potong perahu sendiri. Ada umur 15, 14, 
agenda di teban, di kerja sendiri. Itu dilatih, itu di sekolah sama bapak dulu. The canoe is finished and the moment of truth is at hand. Will she only look good or will she also perform well? Only a trial one will tell. And she does. For the men of Pigapu, she is a dream come true. Next year, their canoe shall join the welcoming convoy at the Kamoro Kakuru, perhaps even lead. But that's another dream for another time. Gliding gracefully, man and canoe become one. A symbol of beauty, power and freedom. A symbol of what it means to be Kamoa.